You're listening to FOJC Radio, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and teaching the doctrine of Christ to the whole world. Good evening and welcome to Friday Night FOJC Remnant Gathering. Grab your Bible and your pens and your paper, and when two or three are gathered in His name, the Lord is right here with us. So thank you for joining us, and here's Brother David. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the September 25th, 2020 edition of the FOJC Remnant Gathering. I am David Carrico, and for the next hour, we're going to be studying the Word of God. Our study for this evening is entitled, The Witness of the Spirit, and we're so thankful for each and every one of you that are going to join us for that. And I just want to say, I have a huge praise report. We have been asking you to pray for us for several weeks now that uh, our new location will be secured. Well, it is. We are praising God that it's a done deal, and uh, we are now going to be entering into the moving process, moving things from ground zero up to there. And when we finally get ready to move our larger items. I know several of you have volunteered to help, and uh, I appreciate that, and I'm going to be calling you up, and I'm going to be saying, hey, remember, uh, you said you'd uh, help us out here, and we'll be calling you up and uh, getting that final move done, but we are just so, so blessed that I, and I'm just so thankful. It's going to be such a blessing, and uh We'll be saying a lot more about it. I imagine we'll be saying some things on the midnight ride tomorrow night. Um, In this new location, uh, our FOJC radio studios and the Now You See TV studios will all be in the same building. And uh, we are going to be opening up a regular Sabbath fellowship. We're going to be calling it the New Puritan Free Assembly. And we're just so thankful for all of your prayers. And we are just expecting great things from the Lord, a great harvest of souls. And uh, we know that it is by prayer that we're going to persevere and do the things the Lord has laid on our heart to do. The Lord has laid on our heart big things. And we have a big God. And... uh, We are going to be praying big, asking big, and stepping out for a huge harvest of souls. We want to remember the Christians in persecution. Persecution is coming to America, and it's here. American citizens are being arrested. There were some several arrested in Idaho for just praying in public so it's here you know we've been talking about this for a long time and it's coming it's coming and it's going to get worse and it's going to intensify so we know and we're going to be prepared for the persecution that's coming uh we want to pray for jd bole and uh for jd and his family we have many requests of survivors that we have been praying with donna's been praying with and working with and uh we just are so excited uh for everything the lord's doing just such tremendous breakthroughs and i know that uh it's really um it's a feast or famine deal now i know so many people that are just drawing closer to the lord and growing like weeds And there are other people that are just getting tremendously depressed uh, to the point of being suicidal. And uh, it's kind of like what John Wesley said when he read read William Law's book on a serious call to a devout and holy life. And John Wesley said, after I read that book, I was convinced that I could not be half a Christian. And we need to all come to that place where we need to realize we cannot be half a Christian. And um, it's going to, uh, and I've said it before and I'll say it again, 
that in this time, for those that are going to totally give their all to Jesus, it's going to be the most exciting time of your life. And I really believe that with all of my heart. So we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this answered prayer and this tremendous blessing. I cannot praise you enough. I know it is only by your miraculous hand and provision that this has come about. So, Father, we thank you so much. And, Father, I ask for strength to be able to do um, all of this that I have to do. And, Father, we just pray that it is just all for your glory, that everything uh, will just be for a tremendous harvest of souls. Father, we want to pray for Donna for strength and for for physical healing we want to pray for all of those that are listening that are dealing with all of this covid craziness we just pray father that you just encourage our hearts and keep us strong and keep us focused upon the kingdom and in the mighty name of jesus we're going to give you the praise for everything good that happens in the mighty name of Jesus we pray, amen and amen. Worship the Lord for a few moments, and we will be back with our study for this evening, The Witness of the Spirit. Sorry, because of the YouTube rules, we cannot put my music on this video recording. However, if you want to hear my music, you can listen to us live on Friday nights at 6 p.m. on our radio page, or you can go to our podcast page and listen to the recordings there. That's FOJCRadio.com. Thank you. God bless. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 8. The witness of the Spirit, whom having not seen, ye love, in whom though ye now see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. We're going to be ministering this evening for a while about a topic that we get about as many questions about as anything, and that's the assurance of salvation, how a person can be saved and know that they are saved, the witness of the Spirit. And we're going to be dealing with understanding our emotions and emotions are different with every individual some people are much more emotional than others um, as a whole I would be a more subdued person than a highly emotional but everyone has emotions they're just expressing them differently and one of the books that I'm going to be using will be referring to several counselors on this study because it is good to have wise counsel on a subject like this because there is um, many people that really struggle with knowing if they're saved or not. And a lot of people think they're too emotional and some people think they're not emotional enough. So we're going to try with the help of the Word of God and some wise counselors to see if we can't get a grip on this. Um, S.A. Keene wrote a book in 1888 called The Faith Papers, and boy, I really like this book a lot. Um, and he had this to say about our faith. He said, there is a faith feeling just as there is a fear feeling or a love feeling. There is no true faith without feeling. Who can confide in a friend without any emotion or pleasure? Or who can accept in good faith the promise of another and not feel a gladness of heart? We are commanded to love the Lord, and love is an emotion. And if we feel nothing, we have no faith and only have a cold and a dark heart. And at the same time, we have to balance our emotions and our faith. And it's hard to talk about this in the aspect of 
every person's emotions are subjective to themselves. Only you can really understand your emotions. So I'm going to try to be very circumspect and say what Scripture says and get some wise counsel to help us all understand this a little better. In 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. The Bible tells us that the Father wants us to know that we are the children of God. He wants us to have assurance of salvation. We have a no-so salvation. You can be saved and you can know it. And this is something in times past that was greatly emphasized that you seldom hear addressed anymore. And the assurance of our salvation, without that, there is a nagging doubt within our heart that eats away at us, and Satan can just beat the pudding out of us constantly, telling us we're not saved, or we're not emotional enough, or we're too emotional, or whatever the case may be. Now, to understand ourselves, we have to understand that we are a body and a soul and a spirit. In 1 Thessalonians 5.23, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And our body's easy to understand, isn't it? And our soul is that immaterial part of us that enables our body to understand the world around us, our sight and our smell, and our touch. These are the windows of the soul, and faith is the window of the spirit, and the spirit is that which is capable of making contact with God. So we are a body, and we are a soul, and we are a spirit, and our emotions rest in what the Bible would call our soul, and we are commanded to be emotional, and because of the Looney Tune nutwhacker charismatics that do such crazy stuff that's so despicable in many ways, we've talked about this a lot, but because there are so many bad examples, uh, people are many times overcautious about showing emotion, and they think that showing emotion is even a bad thing. And in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great. And boy, I've got the wrong one already. And I'm wanting the Shema. Where have I went wrong here today? Oh, Deuteronomy. Okay, I'm in Genesis. That's why it ain't work. I'm in the wrong book. Well, that solves that mystery. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. This is the commandment in the Torah from the Shema. Jesus quoted this and says, This is the first of the commandments. We are commanded to be emotional. And our emotions are in our soul. And we need to understand that as we go through life, and we all have experiences, and everybody has bad experiences, and some much worse than others, that our emotions can become damaged. And our emotions do not react that the way that they should. In the book of Judges, in chapter 16 and verse 16, And it came to pass when she, Delilah, pressed him daily with the words and urged him, speaking of Samson, that his soul was vexed unto death. And Samson's soul was vexed because of the nagging of Delilah. A bad relationship can vex your soul. A death in the family can vex your soul. A divorce can vex your soul. Many things can vex your soul and cause your emotions to become damaged 
to where you do not react in a right way as your emotions should. Uh, sickness is another thing. You can have sickness, and this will damage your emotions. And um, we could talk about medications. There are many medications that people take that very much affect the way they uh, respond emotionally. Um, Charles Ewing Brown uh, had this to say. He said, It must be remembered that these spiritual privileges are enjoyed in different degrees by every Christian. That is to say, the witness of the Spirit is the same to all, just as the Son is the same to all. But as some people have better eyesight to benefit by the light of the Son, so some Christians are more spiritual and thus better able to appropriate these privileges of the assurance of salvation. And it's easier for some people than others because of what some people have been through. But Every believer and every child of God can have the assurance of salvation. And when you are seeking for the confirmation of the assurance of salvation in your life, you need to take into consideration the things that you've experienced and how this might be affecting how you respond emotionally. And we can pray for the healing of our, our emotions, that we can respond with a proper emotional response to our, to our Lord. Now, let's go to the book of Job. Now, there was a guy who went through some stuff. In Job chapter 19 and verse 2, How long will ye vex my soul? And break me in pieces with words. And we're all familiar with the terrible sickness and suffering that Job went through. And then to make it worse, there were three friends who were no friends at all that come along and just heaped condemnation on him and beat him up. Now, you notice it here it says, Break me in pieces, vex my soul, and break me in pieces. Job was what we would call a multiple. Job had abuse to the point where he had splitting of the soul. And this is borne out very explicitly in the, in right here in the 19th chapter of the book of Job. In verse 14, and this also, many people have splits and pieces in their soul. Many people have them that don't realize they have them. And the Lord can take care of that also. Yes, he can. Now, in the 14th verse of Job 19, My kinsfolk have failed, and my familiar friends have forgotten me. Now, we know what that's talking about. Those are his family and friends that when Job got down and didn't have money, uh, they all forsook him. But who is this in verse 19? All my inward friends abhorred me. Now, when a person has the breakdown and the splitting of the soul, there are personalities on the inside that function uh, apart from the core and the whole of that individual. And some, uh, in psychological words, uh, jargon, there is... In every uh, individual, what we would call the core personality. And there's also what we would call an inner self-helper. And this is exactly what it's talking about in Job. All my inward friends abhorred me. Job was having a meltdown. He was having a system failure. He had split into pieces and his system was collapsing. And literally... His, uh, the splits of his personality were literally turning on the core in hatred, and it was an ugly thing. But the Lord brought him through, and the Lord can bring everyone through that has uh, been vexed in their soul to the point where they are broken in pieces. And this comes about as a result of repeated traumatic abuse 
And sad to say, many times this is inflicted on individuals intentionally by evil people that intentionally want to split people for the purpose of manipulating them and controlling them. But Job 19.19, boy, it's right there. All my inward friends aboard me and they whom I loved are turned against me. An amazing text. Now, we'll go to Romans chapter 8. And we'll read the text in the book of Romans that came to be known as John Wesley's scripture. Because John Wesley, he did so many things that was so good and so admirable. But this became known as John Wesley's scripture because he wanted everyone not only to be born again, but he wanted everyone to have the assurance of salvation because Brother Wesley said that You cannot really serve God with a bold confidence without the assurance of salvation. And that makes sense, doesn't it? If you're always doubting your salvation, how can you serve God with a holy boldness because the devil is constantly going to be beating you up with doubt? Now let's read the text in Romans chapter 8, verses 15 and 16. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The Holy Spirit bears witness with our human spirit that we are the children of God. This is something that each and every child of God needs to experience. And you have to understand this and thoroughly seek God for the witness of the Spirit if you haven't, because it is just common sense until you are really walking in a full assurance of your salvation, um, you're obviously going to be beat up by the evil one quite regularly. In Galatians chapter 4 and 6, And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And the Holy Spirit within us that was sent there by Jesus, it will cry unto the Father, Abba, Father. And we will have that witness of the Spirit within us. And as Brother Brown said, it is there in different people in different degrees. And it is just all because of our ability to comprehend it and to perceive it. Now, let's get a definition of the witness of the Spirit from John Wesley. This is how Brother Wesley defined it. He said, but the testimony of the Spirit, I mean an inward impression upon the soul, whereby the Spirit of God immediately and directly witnesses to my spirit that I am a child of God. The Spirit of God speaking to your human spirit, confirming to you supernaturally that you are a child of God. Another uh, a definition here from Charles Ewing Brown, who has uh, an entire chapter on his from his book, The Meaning of Salvation, an excellent chapter. And he said this. He said, This is a conviction created in the heart by the Holy Spirit, assuring the soul of forgiveness and acceptance with God, for he has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And this is something that if you have not experienced it, you need to absolutely Uh, make this priority number one, and we're going to be giving a lot more um, instruction on insurance of salvation spiritually and scripturally to where you can be able to walk in a new assurance of faith 
that will make it a lot harder for the devil to knock knots on your head. Um, S.A. Keene had this to say about it. He said, sometimes indeed, most generally, the last bulwark of unbelief that surrenders to faith is to accept salvation on the word of the Lord without the witness of the Holy Spirit and to rejoice that the Holy Spirit in his own time and in his own way will attest the saving work that shall be wrought in us. Now, I know many people that, uh, and I think a lot of people, their, re-elect, their expectations are unrealistic uh, for many reasons that could enter in. But with every child of God, that supernatural witness of the Spirit, will be there and what brother Keen is saying if you believe the word of God and we're going to be going through clear-cut scriptures uh, just like 1 John 1 9 you can pray uh, you know 1 John 1 9 if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and you have to believe that to receive it and you receive it by faith. Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You have to believe that to be saved. We have faith. And when you repent and place your faith in the death of Christ upon the cross for payment of your sin debt, the Word of God says He will forgive you, He will justify you, and He will receive you into the family of God and send the Spirit of God into your hearts. It begins with faith in the Word and in the Gospel. And if we will receive the witness of faith, and let me read this again, if we receive the witness of faith, then the witness of the Holy Spirit will come to us in greater degrees. Let me read this again. Sometimes, indeed most generally, the last bulwark of unbelief that surrenders to faith is to accept salvation on the word of the Lord without the witness of the Spirit and to rejoice that the Holy Spirit in his own time and in his own way will attest the saving work that shall be wrought in us. And many people, they, uh, I don't know what they're thinking. I think many times their expectations are unrealistic and they begin to doubt and they begin to really, um, well, Brother Keen puts it like this. He says, in proportion as a seeking soul is anxiously concerned for the witness of the Holy Spirit, In that degree, it is doubting. When you are born again by faith in the Word of God, you have to also believe that that witness of the Spirit will come. And when you get so anxious about it, this can become doubt and sin. And then it becomes a blame game with God because somehow God isn't giving you the emotions that you think you should have. So we don't want to go across that line and fall into sin with the witness of the Spirit. And we know that, boy, this is uh, one of the games that the devil loves to play. Now, let's read Romans chapter 10, verse 9 again. And this is one of the most beautiful salvation text. The gospel is encapsulated so well in Romans 10 and 9. And you believe this by faith. If you don't believe, you can't be saved because salvation is by faith. And in Romans 10 and 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. This is where salvation begins, by faith in the gospel and faith in the word, and then we can go from there and we can pray for that witness of the Spirit to come. And don't be anxious about it. And don't be uh, conduct yourself in such a way that you fall into doubt and sin and blaming God on the issue here of the witness. Now, 
S.A. Keene again had this to say. He said, the value of the witness of faith has been greatly underestimated in the instruction of seekers of salvation. And boy, a big amen to that. This is such a neglected topic, and it's a topic that needs to be talked about and expounded in detail because this is something that all of us struggle with at some point in time. Going on, he says it should be emphasized as the objective point in seeking salvation. In other words, this is where we want to get to. We receive the gospel, and we want to know we're saved. We want to know we're saved with the witness of the Spirit. We want to know so salvation. And I know with me, I was born again in the chapel in Indiana State Prison, and I heard the gospel, and I prayed, and I responded from a pure heart. And, of course, like everyone else, I said, well, what happened? I don't know if anything happened, you know. And it was about three days later when it really hit me, when I really realized that something had happened and my heart had changed, and then the emotions begin to flood. And uh, this is how it is, and you have to keep it in perspective. And... He goes on to say, The struggle of most seeking hearts is for the witness of the Holy Spirit. And in most cases, this is so prominent in their minds as to hinder them more than any other thing in attaining it. And boy, that's good advice. And in other words, when you become obsessively worried about how much emotion that you're feeling and uh, worrying about not feeling as much as you should, this can be the greatest hindrance of all to your receiving the greater degrees of the manifestation of the witness of the Holy Spirit. In the book of Hebrews, The book of Hebrews tells us what faith is in that great faith chapter. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, But without faith, it is impossible to please him. We have to believe in the word of God and what it says about salvation to be saved. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. We have to believe that God exists, and that God is a good God, and he will reward them that seek him. And this is so true in the witness of the Spirit, that God will reward you. There is no true faith without feeling, like Brother King said. And our love for the Lord, which is square one requirement, That is an emotion that can grow and grow and grow as the Holy Spirit sheds abroad the love of God in our heart. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 24, For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? And this is just true. You see, the Lord deals with us by faith, and he requires us to have faith. And this is the way that the Lord does things. So we just have to believe, and we can make be sure that if we do our part, that the Lord will do his. And boy, this is another thing. And I tell you what, I just fell in love with this book, Faith Papers by Keene. Good luck finding one. It's probably... Uh, they're pretty hard to come by. But uh, he had this to say. He said, and boy, this is so good. And, you know, when I read this book, you just come away saying, now that guy knew the Lord. He really knew the Lord. He said, here is a spiritual axiom that is invaluable. The witness of faith attained, the witness of the Holy Spirit always follows. Now, let me say that again. Here is a spiritual axiom that is invaluable. 
the witness of faith attained, and we attain that by believing what the Word of God says about salvation. When we repent and believe the gospel and believe the, what the Bible says, uh, Romans 10, 9, 1 John 1, 9, when we have the witness of faith attained, the witness of the Holy Spirit always follows. And the witness of faith maintained retains and increases the power of the witness of the Holy Spirit. That is so good. And when we maintain that witness of the faith, and when Satan comes against us trying to get us to doubt our salvation, we stand on 1 John 1, 9. We have confessed our sins. We have been forgiven. We have been cleansed. We have come confessing and believing we are a child of God. Sometimes you have to say it out loud to the devil. And when we maintain the witness of faith, the witness of the Holy Spirit will always increase. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 12, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. This is one of the roles of the Holy Spirit. He shows us the things that the Father has freely given us, that the Father wants us to have. He wants us to have assurance of salvation, the witness of the Spirit. He doesn't want us to live in agonizing doubt of whether or not we are saved or not. In 1 John chapter 2, and um, I have a quote from R.A. Torrey I'm going to read before we're done. I think 27 times we'll get the exact number that to know is used in this the five chapters of first john it has so much to say about our assurance of salvation in first john chapter 2 beginning in verse 2 and he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world and hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Now let's have an instant replay on verse 3. You want to know whether you know him or not? And hereby we do know that we know him. Know that we know. If we keep his commandments. If you are not living a life of obedience to God. You don't know him. <laughs> you don't know him. You're not saved. Because that's what salvation is all about. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. This is one of the most direct and infallible determinations of whether someone is really born again or not. John Wesley puts it this way. We know that we love God. And keep his commandments, and hereby also we know that we are of God. This is that testimony of our own spirit, which so long as we continue to love God and keep his commandments, continues joined with the testimony of God's spirit that we are the children of God. And the spirit of God that dwells in you, it will motivate you to obey God. It will put a desire in you to obey God. And then when you obey God, you know you're his. Now this is the testimony of our own spirit that we are the children of God. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And every child of God, we did a DOC on the fruit of the Spirit. And what Jesus said is, no fruit, you're out. 
You know, we got to allow the Holy Spirit to bring forth the fruit of the Spirit in our life. And the fruit of the Spirit, uh, there's some emotions there, aren't there? Love and joy and peace. And this is emotions that the Holy Spirit wants to bring through us through the fruit of the Spirit. And he will do that if we so allow. And in the Gospel of John, chapter 5, and um, I think this is actually 1 John 5.24. And in 1 John, no, it's the Gospel of John. I am sorry. The Gospel of John, chapter 5, and verse 24. And this tells us what we are to believe. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. And this is why I just love the doctrine of Christ, because if you hear Jesus' words and believe it and obey it, you have everlasting life, and you can know that you have it, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. This is a no-so salvation that I am talking about. R.A. Torrey, in his book, What the Bible Teaches, he had this to say about the assurance of salvation. Now we know whether we believe or not, and that's true of each and every one out there. You know right now whether you really believe or not, whether we have the real faith in Christ that leads us to receive him, if we have the this faith in Christ, we have God's own written testimony that we have eternal life, that our sins are forgiven, that we are children of God. The word no, a translation of two different Greek words, is found 27 times in the first epistle of John. The Lord wants us to be saved, and he wants us to know that we are saved. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 14, there is another sure determining factor of the assurance of our salvation. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 14 we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. And if we jump down to verse 19, and hereby we know, boy, that word know is in there just a bunch, isn't it? And it's all about knowing we're saved. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. But if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. And in the second half of our teaching, we're going to be talking about the conscience. And we're going to be finding out if we should let our conscience be our guide or not. We're going to be talking about that a little bit. Now, in 1 John chapter 5, we're going to read verses 10 through 13. Then we're going to break. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that, and that ye may believe on the name of of the Son of God. And R.A. Torrey, he said this. He said, The assurance that rests upon our states of feeling will come and go 
as those states vary. But the assurance that rests upon the unchanging word of God will be intelligent and steadfast. Ignorance of the word of God is one of the greatest sources of the lack of assurance. With that, we're going to take a break. We're going to be back with a lot more on the FOJC Remnant Gathering. We'll be right back. We have much to offer here on FOJCRadio.com. Most listeners are familiar with our radio page where we're live on Fridays at 6 p.m. Central Time. And in, it includes our chat room where listeners can fellowship and read the scriptures that I post while Brother David's teaching. If you can't catch us live, we offer our podcast page with the latest audios of our remnant gatherings or the same audios are made into videos and now videos on two new video channels. The easiest way to find our new channels is to go to our ministry news page on FOJCRadio.com. On that page, you'll find links to our new channels uh, on Brideon and the Underground Church FOJC. And there's also links to our Doctrine of Christ series on Jimmy Vision and our Vault series. This makes it a lot easier for you to get the information with just a click. You'll find if there's going to be any events, we have the, that information on there. And we have um, a link to our free books and lots of other info, the latest info is on the ministry news page. I've tried to include answers to frequently asked questions on our Hot Topics page. We also try to help our listeners find local fellowship in their area with the Remnant Locations page. And for those who struggle with abuse issues, I offer my Ritual Abuse and Healing page. Our contact page has a short order form some links for your love gifts, and of course, our contact information. On our resources page, you can find a list of our books, CDs, DVDs, free Bible studies, and tracts that can be printed or read. Check out our online Bible school or our music page. Both include easy-to-click audio files. And most important is our God Wants to Save You page. If you need help in leading someone to the saving mercy and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, there are plenty of uh, things to choose from on that page, including a little prayer that I wrote uh, to help lead people to accepting the Lord and inviting Him to be their Lord and Savior. It's all there, all free, so please use these many things that we offer on our website. We appreciate your support and have tried to make our site easy to navigate. But if you have a problem finding something, just email me at lastdayschurch at cs.com and I will be happy to help. Blessings to all our listeners and thanks again for your prayers and encouragement. Now back to tonight's message with Brother David Carrico on FOJC Radio. Welcome back to the FOJC Remnant Gathering. And as I always do after the break, I want to sincerely thank each and every one of you that prays for us and studies with us and supports us with your gifts and with your kindness we do sincerely appreciate it with all of our heart and uh, thank you so very very much we're going to get back to work we've got um, some more things we want to talk about we've talked about the witness of the spirit the witness of our own spirit and now we're going to talk about the testimony of our conscience in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 And verse 12, For our rejoicing is this, 
the testimony of our conscience that in simplicity and godly sincerity not with fleshly wisdom but Okay, um, we're going to start with uh, 2 Corinthians 1 and 12. We have talked about the witness of the Holy Spirit. We've talked about the witness of our own spirit. And now we're going to talk about the testimony of our conscience, 2 Corinthians 1 and 12. For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world, and more abundantly to you word. And we're going to get a definition of our conscience from John Wesley, and all the quotes I've read from John Wesley this evening is from volume 5 of his works. Um, he had... Um, about three sermons he preached in his sermons uh, that regarded the witness of the Spirit, the witness of her own spirit, and the witness of her conscience. Really, really good stuff. He really understood and really knew the Lord uh, with a passion that I don't know I really feel from anyone else to that degree. But he had this to say. This is his definition of conscience. We may understand by conscience a faculty or power implanted by God in every soul that comes into the world of perceiving what is right or wrong in his own heart or life, in his tempers, thoughts, words, and actions. And everybody, whether you are a Christian or not, you have a conscience. In Romans chapter 2, beginning in verse 14, says, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another and it, Paul was saying here that there are Gentiles that have never even heard of the law that are obeying things that are in the law just because of their conscience so everybody has a conscience but can we let our conscience be your guide and yes if our conscience is renewed and repaired by the Holy Spirit. Now here's the thing also, just like our emotions can become damaged, our conscience can also become damaged. Um, in second, in 1 Timothy chapter 4 beginning in verse 1 Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now, this is a very serious scripture. And have you ever seen someone that was a minister of God that claimed to be a man or woman of God that were doing things that were obviously totally wrong and jacked up and these people had absolutely no conviction that what they were doing was wrong I have seen that more than I would like to even admit to people that are just without a conscience in doing things in the ministry that's just absolutely despicable that is because their conscience has been seared with an iron. They're not bothered by what they do because they're not bothered by what they do. Their conscience no longer troubles them because they have overrode 
the conviction of the Holy Spirit and the warnings of their conscience and literally seared it with a hot iron. These are the walking dead. They have given themselves over to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils and they're uh it's just like being a spiritual psychopath they uh they literally do terrible things and um uh that no one should do let alone someone that claims to be um a servant of the lord that ministers to others in the book of hebrews chapter 10 and verse 22, now, we have all, I can safely say, at some time or another, we have been on a course in our life, and the Holy Spirit has dealt with us, and we haven't turned back the right way as quickly as we should have. And uh, this can damage our conscience but when we repent and come back to the Lord, our consciences, just like our emotions, can be repaired. And we just need to sprinkle them a little bit. Uh, in Hebrews 10 and 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water now we're not talking about getting anybody wet here we're talking about the spiritual washing of the spirit of god the washing of water by the word ephesians 5 5 26 the washing of regeneration titus 3 and 5 and our consciences can be repaired by the holy spirit now we're born with a good conscience and we can get our conscience messed up but when we get our conscience repaired by the holy spirit the holy spirit can use our conscience to speak to us and guide us this is one of the best and one of the most primary ways that the holy spirit can speak to us and can guide us but if your mind is not renewed by the word of God your conscience is going to be faulty now in Romans chapter 12 and well let me see I want to read Hebrews 9 14 before I go to Romans um, another text in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14 because this is important how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience? Our conscience needs purged. We were talking on our DOC of, uh, about that word purge in our episode on the vine and the branches, how that means to cleanse and to purify Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Now, here's what happens. When you come under the influence of a religious teacher that's teaching error, because you trust that person, your mind can override your conscience, and you will either believe that things are right that are actually wrong or you will believe that things are wrong that are actually right and we have to purge our conscience from dead works and I would say that probably 95 percent or more of the religious works in America are dead works they're dead religious works rather than works that are really given in heartfelt service to the living God. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. If you do not renew your mind by the Holy Spirit, your conscience will be faulty. 
only when we allow our conscience to be purged from dead works by being focused on the Word of God can we bring our conscience in line with the Holy Spirit where then our conscience can really uh, become a real area where the Lord can guide us and uh, where the Lord can speak to us. Now, our conscience is different than the speaking of the Holy Spirit to us. But our the Holy Spirit will greatly use our conscience if we can renew ourselves in the Word of God. And it can be a tremendous, tremendous asset in uh, very immediate and quick leading of the Holy Spirit because our conscience can speak to us in an instant. Now, in Titus chapter 1, verse 15, this is another thing that can happen. Under the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. A defiled conscience. And this is talking about people that think things are impure that are actually pure. Now, this is like everything else. This just gets all messed up. Uh, many people that should understand that eating pork will defile you, just like the Bible says, uh, they don't think it will. And there are other things that uh, it works the other way. Let's... Um, one example uh, that we could give, and, uh, well, I think I want to wait a minute on that. I'm going to give an example here in a minute. But let's get a little help from 1 Corinthians. Um, and some people are so bound up in legalism and man-made religion that they couldn't enjoy ice cream. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse 25. Now, this is uh, has a lot to say about the conscience in a lot of different directions. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles or in the market, that eat asking no question for conscience sake. Now, when this was speaking to the believers in Corinth, that when they went down to the market to buy meat, that they, if it was there and uh, it wasn't known that this come from an idol temple, that it was okay for them to buy it without asking questions. Now, for the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. In verse 27, if any of them that believe not bid you to a feast and ye be disposed to go, Whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking no question for conscience sake. And and that doesn't mean that uh, we go over to the neighbor's house and fire up a big pork chop. but And this was in the context of meat sacrificed to idols. There was a lot of banquets and what would be the equivalent of our trade unions where they would have feasts and they would sacrifice animals to gods in in these big banquets and what was left they would take and they would sell on the meat market and this is exactly what it's talking about now uh, in verse 28 but if any man say unto you this is offered in sacrifice unto idols eat not for his sake that shoot it and when you know that something was offered up to an idol you were not to eat it because of the conscience of that individual. And for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? Now, there are things that are clearly stated in the word of God many things and then there are things that people incorrectly think are either right or wrong only because of their own conscience and we cannot allow other people to judge us on the mandates 
of what they perceive within their conscience. Now, in Romans chapter 14, the Word of God speaks to this issue. And it says here in Romans chapter 14 and verse 1, Him that is weak in the faith receive, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Now, uh, when people have something they believe because of their conscience, let's take, for instance, let's just take the in, the example of a woman's head covering. Now, if a woman uh, and a woman in uh, in the scripture, the the woman's hair and her husband are her covering. This is clearly stated we're not going to go through the whole scripture i'm just going to use this for an example but there are women because they have come under false teaching that believe they should have their head covered and this is something that's in their conscience it's not from the holy spirit now if a woman comes to our assembly and because of her conscience wants to cover her head i'm fine with that cover your head if if the if that individual wants to try to be holier than thou and put down the other women that don't have their head covered, now that's something we'll have to address. But I have no problem with somebody that would do that. You see, we want to receive the and you see the person there, they might perceive themselves of more strong in the faith because they're doing that when in reality they're the weaker one in the faith because they're moving according to their conscience and not the Holy Spirit. But nah, <coughs> if they're not going to be divisive about it, no problem. We don't make arguments and doubtful disputations over matters of conscience, but we do instruct with the Word of God so that people can come from being led by their conscience that is faulty unto being led by the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 9 this is where we all want to be holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience Yes, our conscience pure and undefiled like the text in 1 John that our heart condemns us not in that which we do. In Acts chapter 24 and verse 16, And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. And in Acts, there's a lot in the Word of God about our conscience. A lot. And in Acts chapter 23 and verse 1. And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God unto this day. So understanding our conscience and the role that it plays in the witness of the Spirit and the role that it plays in God's leading and speaking to us is very, very important. In 1 John chapter 3, beginning in verse 19, we'll read this text again. We read it uh, just before break in the first half, but let's read it again because it's speaking to the conscience. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart, and knoweth all things. But if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. And having a conscience that is clear before God is one of the surest ways to have the witness of the Spirit. Like it says in verse 19, And hereby we know that we are the truth. If we have a pure conscience before the Father, this is the witness of the Spirit. And 
we're going to close with this text in the book of Proverbs. And in Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 27, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. We talked in uh, in this lesson how that we have a body and a soul and a spirit, and our human spirit is the candle of the Lord, and the Lord will use the Holy Spirit to search our most inward parts to help bring our mind and our conscience in line with the Word of God so that we can have this great benefit of the Holy Spirit using our conscience to guide us, to correct us, and to speak to us. Well, we're going to stop there this evening. And uh, as always, I want to thank each and every one of you that have studied with us this evening. Um, Such an important topic. And um, it is something that we all need to pay great heed to the witness of the Spirit because this is a spiritual blessing that we don't want to be without. Um, Tomorrow night, I will be in the studio with John and uh, be looking forward greatly to doing the Midnight Ride. And uh, I will be, I'm so glad to be actually into the process of actually moving things from ground zero here uh, to our new location. We are going to be in the Tell City, Indiana area, and um, it's not going to be a great secret. We're going to be opening up. We've got a lot of work to do, and uh, there's some structural things have to be addressed, but it's not going to be months down the road. It's going to be weeks, and um, We'll be opening up for regular meetings, uh, John and I, and it's going to be a great thing. And uh, we're we're just so looking forward to it. We're looking forward to uh, many of you being to come there and fellowship with us. And we're going to be having uh, special meetings and everything. And, of course, we'll be observing the feast there. And uh, we're looking forward um, to Passover. It was just... um, just didn't have enough time to get things together for um, the fall feast, but it's going to be a great Passover. We're going to be greatly looking forward to it. So with that, we're going to close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness and your mercy and your grace toward us. Father, we just pray that each and every one listening to this broadcast will be saved and that they will know that they're saved, that they will have the witness of the Spirit within them, that they study and pray and seek you much on this issue, that they will have that assurance in their heart that will be such a strength unto them, because this is truly a blessing you want to give to all of your children. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray and we agree. Amen and amen. God bless you all. We will see you next Friday night. 6 p.m. Central on the FOJC Remnant Gathering. Thank you for being a part of our Friday night FOJC Remnant Gathering. You can contact us at FOJC Post Office Box 4174 Evansville, Indiana 47724 dash 4174 or you can check our website out at www.fojcradio.com or you can email us at lastdayschurch at cs.com or you can call us at 812-473-3735 thanks and god bless